All right, so yeah, my name is Reese Bogardis. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Geophysical Institute up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, I'm with the Arctic Coastal Geoscience Lab. Um, today, I wanted to talk about a, a, an exciting project that has implications on the Aleutian Southwest uh, Alaska in general, um, developing high resolution records of storm and from the Southern Bering Sea. Um, it's a National Science Foundation funded project and it's, uh, it's joint research between Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, UAF, and the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Um, what I wanted to talk about today was the, um, the sort of the background or the, the inspiration for the project, um, the scientific basis of the, the methods that are, that are ongoing, as well as some of the broader implications. Um, so why should you care? Why study storms? Um, sort of that's a, a statement that's obvious to people who live in Alaska is that Alaska is on the front lines of, of global environmental change. Um, the rates of warming in Alaska are more than double that of the rest of the United States. And the sort of the implications of this warming are very much made apparent on coastlines um, just because their dynamicism is very much controlled by the factors that are impacted by, by climate change. So that's important to consider. We have roughly 80% of Alaska's population lives on the coastline. And that means that it's sort of where the, the land, ocean, climate, and people all come together. So what that means is people's culture, livelihood, economic well-being, infrastructure, things like that are, are in play here. So, uh, And so if you live on the coastline, it's also pretty obvious that the in addition to the environmental factors that are impacted by just general warming, most of the change that we see are these instantaneous storm events that are driving most of the coastal change that we see. Um, and that also is an important point because if you actually wanna learn about, you know, what drives changes in storm in it, storm intensity, storm frequency, um, you need a, a record of, of storms to learn from, right? And the, the record of storminess in the region only really extends back about 70 years. So, so yeah, so um, starting in the mid 70s, we have a concrete like record of storms because we can see storms from space. Starting in the 50s, we have reanalysis data. And then of course there's the living record. So the memory of storms that people who live in the region remember. And these three points together sort of form the linchpin of what the point of the project is. And that is, uh, <coughs> to actually extend these records of storms thousands of years to, to figure out how these broader climatic factors control storminess. Um, so again, storm frequency, storm intensity. So this is a map showing the, um, the global occurrence of extratropical cyclones like this one off the coast of the Carolinas. And it's over 42 years from, from 1979 to 2020. Um, and uh, the, essentially the darker the red is the the higher occurrence of storms, right? So two things jump out really is that the pattern of storminess is very obviously controlled by global atmospheric circulation, which in turn is very much controlled by global climate. And that too, for people that live in Southwest Alaska is a, an obvious point. The region is what I like to call a cat. Um, storms that usually um, are, like, are generated off the coast of Japan and then in the moved up here from westerlies. And what it kind of sets up is there's these two, um, for lack of a better term, storm highways that, that happen because of seasonal differences. So winter usually forms a more northerly track for storms and um, summer makes storms uh, go more towards the Gulf of Alaska. And this um, sort of storm highway is why we targeted the Southern Bering Sea. It's the to stick with that analogy, you can view it like the median of the storm highway, in which case it's a good place to look for records of storms, which leads me to what the point of the project is. So to go back to this point, 1979 to 2020, we know what storms are doing. So we have to think about, you know, what are the signatures that storms leave behind that you can find um, that actually record an archive of storm and it's thousands of years in the past so that we can learn something about the global climate. So um, what we decided to do was we look for those signatures in sediment with the idea being that when storms pass over a region, right, 
it, they're very high energy events. So it mixes up the ocean with uh, waves, currents, things like that, that can actually transport um, larger sediment and be deposited in places that I'm about to talk about. But so the project made use of the um, RV Sekuliak. It's a National Science Foundation owned ship. It's ran by UAF's um, College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. Um, it's 261 feet. It's one of America's very few icebreakers. And um, we did sediment cores off the, off the ship. It can hold roughly 40 people, about 24 scientists. Um, and it's a pretty awesome experience. What we did was we made way from Seward and went transited out to ADAC and back over um, about 23 days, 24 days in, uh, in August. And what we did was we made a lot of stops in places where there were bays or fjords um, for reasons that I'll talk about very soon. Um, we were targeting places that had a deep basin, so the very uh, near shore deep basins that were hopefully protected from the open ocean by some sort of shallow sill with the idea being, like I said, if a storm has high energy in the ocean and it can transport and deposit larger sediment than you know, that would normally be deposited in these basins, they are then archived and not disturbed since they're um, protected from open ocean, right? Um, and what that looks like just conceptually, so again, here's like, here's a shallow sail in a deep basin. These basins are so deep that there's very minimal um, actual movement of water in the water column. There is, but just um, not a lot of energy. So what that means is that sediment that's deposited in these very deep basins are usually very fine grain, um, silt to mud. And that during a storm event, you have much more energy in the water column that's able to pick up and move um, larger grain sediment. And so that's what these like darker layers represent. That's, that happens through time. Um, and this just looks like to the, to the naked eye anyways is, you see, if you were to actually take a sediment core of this basin, uh, quiescent conditions or you know non-storm conditions would be very fine grained, and then an event would be um, larger grain because of the, the, the energy of the um, So what that means is this section might be hundreds of thousands of years. This might be two days, and then this might be hundreds of thousands of years. And that's, again, that's the crux of, of the methods for, for the project. To show you what that looks like with real data. So this is um, seismic uh, sub-bottom data that we collected from the ship. Again, here's a, a shallow sill and uh, here's a, a basin that, this is the sort of the view that we have from the ship to target where we think there is a record of some sort of environmental process. So the darker colors are denser layers in, in the ocean floor. Um, and that red box is a, an actual um, footprint of a core that we collected. It's about 20 meters. Um, and we have a, a conceptual diagram here of one of the types of coring methods that we use from this ship called a jumbo piston core. Um, maybe you saw that at Chris's poster earlier today. Um, the basic concept is this, this um, configuration is lowered from the ship. And once the trigger core hits the bottom, and it's a known depth, so we know how deep it's going to be, right? It trips a, a trigger arm that has more slack that releases a core that has, so like this would be roughly two to 3,000 pounds of release and gravity would um, let it penetrate the ocean floor. So like I said, in this case, this is an actual location of where we took the core. We got 20 meters of, of sediment um, with this method. So with the, the the crews that we went on um, using this, these types of pouring methods, we collected roughly 500 meters of sediment. And that's, um, that's taller than the Eiffel Tower worth of sediment. Um, also this type of data as well, seismic sub bottom profiling and bathymetry, we collected thousands of kilometers worth of data, terabytes of data, pretty, pretty awesome. But so we have all this data now, because like I said, this was just this last August that we collected the sediment course. And now we're sort of beginning the process to, to analyze what sort of archives that we have, what, what story do we have of environmental change? And 
we have a sort of a suite of different methods that we're that we um, employing to figure out if, um, if these are event layers and also to um, actually correlate an age depth relationship, which is of course imperative for actually saying something about storm frequency and intensity through time. So one of the methods is um, radiography. So essentially like an x-ray that you get of your foot or something. So this is what this is. And so the lighter colors actually uh, correlate to denser layers. Loss on ignition analysis is a way that we can quantify what percentage of organics that there are in a pore per depth. Um, coarse fraction and grain size distribution measurements um, is one of the most important ones there. And that is actually using a, um, we're using a particle size analyzer to quantify this, the changes in the size of sediments through the core. Um, the rest of them, magnetic susceptibility, electrical resistivity, et cetera, are more probing methods that you can scan the core prior to um, actually physically sampling the core to get at what you have. And that's what this data is. It's, an on, it's ongoing and in progress. Um, but we were able to scan it and actually get at differences in density, porosity, magnetic susceptibility, things like that, that um, tell you a lot about where that event layer may have come from, whether or not, um, for example, it's a storm event or a tsunami or a volcanic layer, things like that. And then we're, we're quantifying that age depth relationship with radioisotope dating, so mainly um, carbon dating, and we're also using uh, gamma spectroscopy to age the top portions of the core um, using lead 210, cesium 137. Um, so the other exciting part of the project that we did while we were on the ship, which is something that I, I find very interesting is in order for us to actually learn more about what the water column is doing during storm conditions. So that gets at, you know, what actually are we, finding records of in the cores. We deployed um, eight wave buoys in the Aleutians and they're, um, they're telemetered. So we're getting real-time data um, and they report things like wave height, direction, spreading, sea surface temperature and atmospheric pressure. Um, we also deployed current meters, um, pressure gauges so that we could actually measure differences in the water level with, uh, with the storm. So um, tides, storm surge, things like that. And then we also deployed um, two meteorological stations like this one um, to actually um, have real-time observations of when a storm is coming or, or impacting uh, our sites. And so this data is also publicly available. Um, it's all incorporated on the, that URL there, the Alaska Ocean Observing System. But it's also feeding into a component of the project that I'm, that I'm also working on, and that is numerical modeling. Um, so that's sort of instrumental data that we're collecting with those uh, with our observations, using to sort of fill in the gaps of what the water column is doing when a storm happens. So quantifying things like waves, currents, and tides, again, to sort of inform what we're looking at in the course. And then the, the very powerful part of the modeling is what we call uh, identifying minimum disturbance thresholds. So what's the minimum amount of, of energy is required to actually move the large grain sediment that's in the event layers that we see. Uh, so that's sort of an example of what these are. So this is a, like one deep point in a model um, that, we, that we modeled actual uh, modern storms that we had observations for to sort of calibrate our models and, and, and um, we're actually getting results that we're seeing in the sediment cores, right? If you put this together and actually make it two-dimensional, we're doing things such as this. Um, um, so this is actually a 2D representation of a 3D model of sediment concentration deposits uh, on the ocean floor during different wind scenarios. And th this is an example of us trying to figure out. So if where you took a sediment core Using this information, we can tell, are you getting records of every single storm that happened there? Or are you getting records of only very powerful storms, which is very important for us to know, right? So um, overall, like I said, our huge goal is to lengthen the records of storm events in the region, which will actually enable us to say something about what past conditions control storm events in the region, which as you could imagine has very important implications for us 
that live on the coast. And yeah, thank you very much. So as I don't know if you minutes, we've got a couple minutes for questions. I'll come in a bit and start switching screens or switching presentations. Answering questions. Yeah. Fantastic presentation. Really loved it. Thank I, you. So I'm always wondering about storms. So I do birds, and uh, so we in Birdland um, are always interested in the index of storms. Um, there have been, yeah, actually, there are. Um, there's some uh, atmospheric study papers that use uh, reanalysis data that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Um, the one that comes to mind, for example, that was done actually up at UAF is uh, the Cyclone Activity Index or something like that, where it's essentially enumerating the same sort of um, the same sort of information that was on this map yeah. through time. So there are actually, yeah. It's the, uh, of course, it's up for a debate on like what's the best way to actually characterize that and what's actually represented. But people are doing that, yeah. Yeah. So do you have plans to do more cores, or are you just like trying to get through? The yeah, right and now we have that. an insane amount of data to go yeah. through. Yeah. Um, like just actually recently got our the sediment cores like for my dissertation shifted up to two thirds. Okay. Next presentation, but feel free to take any questions. Too, but yeah, do you refer to weather stations like out in the oceans? Like, how does that have implications for people that live out there? Is that acceptable through the AOS website? Yeah, actually, and we've had uh, we actually have had a lot of people reach out to us that you know that um, people that live in the area have seen our wave buoys and contacted us. And uh, we, I mean, it with we are trying to get the word out because the, the data is. You know, as you could imagine, it's a very under-instrumented region, so it's a pretty big deal that we've deployed all these instruments and that they are all publicly available, so it's pretty exciting, yeah. yeah. Time for one more question. Thank you very much. Take it away. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt, and I'm a grad student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, working with the environmental or the water and environmental research center work up there. Um, and I just want to say before I get started here that I thought I was giving a poster talk today, and then I saw my name on the schedule yesterday, so I kind of threw some slides together. It should be short and sweet, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and maybe a break at the end. So before I get started, this project was funded by uh, NASA and the NSF. And this is an ongoing project from 2019 and it's funded through 2025 and hoping to keep it going and extend it past that. So Fresh Ice is a project centered around connecting Arctic communities through a modernized freshwater ice observation network. And there's a lot of different things that kind of play into that. So some of our big research questions when this project was coming together back in 2019 what is changing with annual river and lake ice phenology? So that's that annual freeze up and break up timing and ice thickness and just the formation of ice. Um, and can we expand river and lake ice observations through providing a network and a, and a platform to get K through 12 uh, students involved with collecting data and submitting their data and presenting their data? And then also, can we maintain a statewide network of these community-based monitoring teams, whether it be individual students and in individual classrooms or just communities in general? So this is kind of what all these different questions come together to look like. You can see all those yellow stars on the map there are all of our community-based monitoring teams that are part of the Fresh Eyes on Ice team. Um, so going from the top down, we have the, the big part of science education and outreach, um, which takes into account these CBMTs, community-based monitoring teams, snow, ice, and STEM workshops and trainings, um, and historic knowledge and storytelling. We know that, like the last presentation, before so long ago, we don't have all this data stored in in a hard drive somewhere, we need to rely on people's stories and, and what they know and the knowledge they can share with us to get a greater understanding of how ice used to form and freeze and break up in the past and how that may be changing. Um, so yeah, past, present, and future ice observations. And the, the way we're getting through that is through field surveys across Western and Interior Alaska. So going out 
every year, every winter, and going to the same sites and measuring the ice thickness over time um, using remote sensing and satellite imagery. And we have a couple people with the team who are really focused on that and, and coming up with some cool products. And then also cameras, buoys, radars, data loggers, all that standard stuff that we can deploy in the field, collect data, come back and, and look at it for the next spring. So like I mentioned, learning from our elders and learning from the people who have come before us, they know a lot about the land and they've lived here and interacted with the rivers and used them a lot longer than, than me, you know, coming from the lower 48 and, and the region that's so different. It's really, we really depend on those, those observations of people. And learning from the past, you know, just other, other historic information we can gather to kind of to put together the bigger picture of, of the changes in the espionology. And then observing the present. So this is where we're at today, you know, getting people involved, getting communities together and getting scientists and researchers all together to, to kind of keep this statewide ice observation network up and running. Um, so another big important part of this project is just getting youth outdoors and observing the environment. It's good for people to kind of, you know, have a sense of place and want to be excited to go and, and look at their, their homeland and like know I can go and gather data and I can make a difference in this place. Um, and stemming off of that, you know, we, we're really focused on encouraging STEM education and, and developing children's confidence to, to want to pursue science and STEM fields and, as they get older. So here's a look at some of our different community-based monitoring teams, uh, you know, anywhere from No Attack to Fairbanks to Bethel, Galena. And let me just list off all the active community-based monitoring teams we have right now. And we meet um, once a month with teachers and sometimes the teachers have a few of their students sit in on these meetings. So it's really good to bring everyone together once a month and, and kind of check in on how everyone's doing. And those communities include Arctic Village, Beaver, Bethel, Chitna, Eagle, Fairbanks, Galena, Glen Allen, Kenny Lake, Kobuk, Nantasta, McGrath, Nanina, Noatak, Shagalut, Sleep Mute, Tok Tulik, Utriavik, and Venati. So you can see it's a pretty comprehensive network of all these communities going out and collecting data and submitting it. Um, so that's awesome. And we added a lot of other communities in 2020, more in 2021. I don't think any new ones this year, but we're always looking to kind of expand this network of, of teams. So here's a look at some of the data that actual students, you know, K through five, K through 12 students will go out and gather and then input this data themselves and get to see it graphed in real time. One example from Molina and one from McGrath um, kind of shows a few years, 20 to 20, 22 in this year. So you can kind of see, you know, that middle zero axis is, is the, so the ice depth below and the, the snow depth above. And it's good for them to like, look at things like, oh, if we got a lot of snow in the beginning of the year, we see that the ice doesn't get as thick afterwards, or we didn't get a lot of snow and the ice grew thicker, things like that. It's cool to, to have the kids be involved with actually getting this data, uploading it, plotting it, and, and playing around with it. So we also put on a lot of bigger workshops, which bring together people from different schools or, or just a, a general region. Um, we've hosted one every year since the, the project concept in 1920. And then there's actually another workshop coming up at the end of the month in Delta Junction. So if anyone's in the area and wants more info on that, you can share that. Another thing that um, some of our team members have been really, really involved with is going on these annual field expeditions. So this year, Chris, Chris, um, our Sarah Clement and Alan Bondera, they flew out to McGrath where last winter they left a couple snow machines and a bunch of equipment. Took all those down the Cuscoquam River, traveled across the Iditarod Trail, went back up and over up the Yukon and ended in Galena. And along the way, they got to visit a couple of communities and work with the kids hands on and attend one of the science fairs at the school. So that was really awesome. And in total, 550 mile journey. So it was quite the trip for them. Got a lot of good data as well along the way. And so what do we do with all this data that we collect as researchers and scientists and our communities collect? Well, we want to collaborate with community members, educators, you know, policymakers, all that stuff to create data sets that can be used for safety, planning, science, and learning. Um, so all this data that we collect is publicly available and you can find it on the Fresh Eyes on Ice website. And if you're ever wondering, oh, I wonder, the ice is super thin this year. I wonder what it's been in the past. You can always go to our site, and go and find that data. Um, another thing that we're really involved with is sharing freeze up and break up observations across the state via platforms like Facebook or, or on our website directly. Because a lot of people, as you all know, depend on rivers for travel and commerce, for 
pretty much half the year in Alaska. You know, without without those waterways, we can't get around and do the things that we need to do. And um, and so being able to go to a place and have observations that are being submitted, you know, you know that river ice is going to be safe this week, and we can go and get done what we need to get done, or go travel. So it's cool to, to provide a platform for people to come together and share their own observations and pictures. Um, so here's just an example of our website and some of the different ways you can submit or view data. Globe Observer is a cool app, which is kind of NASA's one of their apps, which you can go and submit land cover data or veg density data or ice cover data, things like that. Um, we have our platform for our communities to submit their stuff here, and you can go on here and find everything that, that we're talking about. Um, so there's this whole aspect of, you know, getting, getting youth involved and communities involved, but also the project has allowed for individual people to, to get, take a deeper look at some different other research topics, which is really cool. And uh, Dana Brown and, and Melanie up at UAF have done a lot of cool work in the last couple of years trying to utilize synthetic aperture radar or SAR data, satellite data from up in the sky using microwaves, like one millimeter to a meter, because that wavelength you can kind of penetrate or bounce off the ice and bounce off the open water in different ways and, and try to map on like a more global or regional scale um, where those open water zones are so we can like identify them. And the, the way that this kind of works is we have these different river monitoring cameras set up. You know, we look at the synthetic aperture radar data, try to classify it and then try to ground truth it by either being out there on a snow machine or, or using these um, monitoring cameras as well. Um, this is random, but just another new tool if anyone's interested. Uh, Chris and, and Alan have been making these new ice scoops, which, you know, if you're running out ice fishing for the weekend, you can contact him and get one of these sent to you and just includes like a little measuring tape on the side. You know, you can scoop your ice out and clear your fishing hole, but also just while you're out there, snap a picture of the ice depth, snap a picture of the, the conditions and just contribute to, to keep this data set going and keep it growing and, and be as comprehensive as possible. So we're here in Dillingham. Um, you know, it's a lot different than, than up in the interior of the Arctic. Um, but as you can see, it's one of the regions that's kind of lacking on our network of coverage, both the Southwest and the Southeast. So if people here are interested here, that's kind of why I was excited to come out and, and share our project and get people um, aware of it. So that if, if anyone knows teachers or, or people in the community who might want to be involved or be a direct contact, I would love to get that contact info and be searching them out the rest of the week here as well. Um, because it's like like Bill's talk on um, yesterday, it's just good to get people involved with collecting data and contributing something to their own their own backyard, you know? So that's something we'd be eager to, to work with some of the teachers and educators here in the, the Bristol Bay region and get and get them excited in the part of the team as well. You know, and so also one other change is we want to talk to people and see what changes they've noticed in and the timing of freeze up and break up and and you know the what i'm presenting today is not so much of the numbers and the smaller numerical studies that we've done with all this data but like just getting people talking about it and seeing oh how does climate change and how are all these environmental factors affecting what we're seeing as far as the, the safe river travel season and how these changes impacted the lives of people in this region specifically Um, there's a whole bunch of collaborators that, that we partner with on this. I won't go through all of them, but State Parks, NASA Globe, the, the Weather Service, the USGS, um, and then all those different communities that we talked about earlier. So it's without all these partners and all these people making it happen, it wouldn't be what it is today. And then Chris Art, Dana, Lauren, Katie, Elena, Brooke, all the, the main cloud or the, the investigators on this. And we have a whole bunch of collaborators, researchers, and students involved as well. Spanning the GI, uh, IR work, all these different institutes at, at the university. So it's a really collaborative um, project, which is cool to see. And I just want to give a thanks to EBSCOR for funding me to travel here and, and be able to meet all of you and share with everyone and thank the, the members and the faculty here at Crystal Bay to, for hosting us and, and putting on such a great conference. And if you're interested in our website, Facebook, Instagram, all of those are pretty active. Um, so those links are there for you. And uh, with that, does anyone have any questions? So, 
do you know what has been most effective um, or convincing to for teachers to become involved? You know the, in the yeah the biggest struggle with like new CBMTs when getting right. them on board is teachers not having confidence in knowing all right like what's the process or how do we go out and get a good like meaningful measurement and not just waste our time and how do we make it useful? So what we try to do when we incorporate new CBMTs is actually go out and visit them and things like that yeah. spring traverse that, that just happened. Or we can fly out, like we had a, a team fly out to sleep mute um, two months ago and go and meet with the meet with them and just show them like share all of our knowledge and share like, all right, let's go out and take measurements and here's what we can do with them. So just actually going out and having an in-person like interaction like that is super helpful. But also the monthly meetings we have with each of the each of the teachers and all the different people involved that that helps keep things moving along too um but like everyone is busy and everyone has their own schedules going on so when when like yeah. a, a team is not um publishing their data every month or they're not getting out you know there's no no foul in that um but we want to encourage them and empower them to have the tools and resources they need um, to make it happen yeah i just i work with a lot of teachers and i hear a lot like i don't have time yeah and i I have to do language arts and social studies. Yeah. Because... I think the great thing with this project is we have a few people that are solely dedicated on STEM and yeah. STEM outreach and, and yeah. youth education. So they're they're not, you know, they're not hydrologists and they're not studying ice and they're not looking at numbers. But those people are really the ones that make the CBMTs all come together and because yeah. that's their their sole focus. And so having having people outside of the research realm. And the science realm on a team can, can go a long way. Yeah. That's like Katie Elena. Exactly. Katie Elena Sarah as well. Yeah. She's working on her master's in science outreach. Anything else? Yeah. How much is it like? So there's the ice observations, but then what are the observations for? Is it for like travel? Is it for? So it's for all kinds of things. Or, yeah. Um, there's like the whole aspect of just using, it's an easy way to get youth involved with the science and, and collecting data, but then also the fact, the aspect of, you know, we can go back and look at overlay annual temperature and annual snow depth and annual ice thickness and break up and freeze up timing and kind of draw some greater conclusions about how that's intertwined with environmental factors. Um, so things like that, and just kind of having a more, a greater data set. So when we have these questions and we wanna know Oh, how do formations of ice dams impact habitat or salmon habit, spawning habitat? Questions like that, then, then we have the data to go and back it up. Or I'm thinking more of like, you know, what is useful on the community level and not like, you know, my grandma's gonna post on Facebook, like, oh, I went to my and I caught this many and the ice is good. You yeah. know, like, so having kind of that. Yeah, on the thing. community level, yeah, okay. like when, especially like all over the interior and, if you're depending, you know, you need to get from point A to point B, um, then just having a place to go and, and see other people's observations and get a sense of what conditions are like at that time will increase safe river travel and just like decrease the hazards associated with, with that. And yeah. That's on one other hand. I was just going to say, do you notice the uh, increase in hits on your data? portal during the uh, Nana Ice Classic. We do, yeah. <laughs> and we, we get a lot more hits on during breakup and because, you know, things are happening. There's there's ice jam flooding and all these things that are in thermal versus um, versus kinetic breakup and things like that. So we definitely get a lot more interest and involvement in that breakup time, but, but you know, we're interested in, in the entire winter season, so. Cool, well, thank you. Before we start the next presentation, there are some few chairs here. So if you came in, I encourage you to, to find a seat. Um, which is why we're here because um, 
for starting something and you want to start here and so we want all of your feedback. Um, so we work with a group of folks from the Alaska Coastal Cooperative, IARC, ASEP, uh, and the Alaska Satellite Facility. Um, and so what we're looking for today, and I don't know if some of them are on Zoom or not, they might be here. We'll see. But anyway, uh, go ahead. Um, so we're a group and um, that's just kind of coming together and starting to have discussions about this. And what this comes from is um, a real need and a usefulness of having geospatial education and geospatial expertise, especially in community planning as we go forward and things like climate change and adaptation planning um, and things like that. Right now, there's not really a cohesive pathway across the street for, or across the state for like, how do you learn about geospatial tools? How do you get trained in GIS? How do you, you know, have these tools that you can then use for your own community self advocacy and that kind of stuff? So that's our goal is long term to create a pathway for learning about and applying geospatial data and technology. Before I get too into it, I know a lot of folks in this room use maps. You're already well versed in it, um, but a lot of us don't get into or don't know what geospatial means until suddenly you realize you need something and you don't know how to get it, right? Um, so when we're talking about geospatial data, all that means is that it can be mapped. It's something that whatever piece of data or information it is, it matters where it is on Earth or it matters where it is in time. Um, so geospatial simplified just means can it be mapped? Um, and so where we're kind of heading with this is to have this sort of three-tiered um, levels of education and training and tools. Um, and so like at the baseline level, um, K-12 education around mapping and spatial awareness um, and then providing baseline maps for community or baseline mapping skills for community members. Next level would be that kind of applied community use. So how do I you know, put together a map that conveys this information that maybe gets me funded, right? Um, and also kind of at the student level too. Um, and then up into the um, kind of advanced GIS or advanced geospatial professional level, um, graduate students and beyond. Um, and so that'll make more sense in just a second too. All right, so um, we call this a presentation, but it's really not. Um, it is after lunch. So what we're gonna do is wake you guys up a little bit <laughs> um, and get your feedback. So. Today what we're gonna do is Noel's gonna share a couple just quick examples. I think also in this conference, we've already seen a ton of awesome examples of geospatial tools in use um, and used especially at the community level. Um, and then we're gonna get you guys talking to each other for a minute. So wake up and get some ideas generating. Um, and then we're gonna ask you if you're up for it to um, please help us with some information. We're gonna give you guys a survey. Um, you can fill it out online with QR code or I do have paper copies as well. There is Wi-Fi here to get you out when you get there. Um, and so that's where we'll go from here. Yeah, so we've, if you guys have been at any of the presentations last couple of days, you've already seen some really incredible uses of geospatial information. And you might be realizing that you actually use geospatial data in your projects, even if you didn't know that it had a fancy name that people call it geospatial information. So this is a component of so many ongoing projects. Um, and really, even from starting at coming up with these baseline informations for community planning efforts, if you attended Casey's talk yesterday, which was awesome, looking at understanding berry distributions and where they might go. So if we know where berries are now, we know what some of the environmental conditions are, where they are, and we know what those conditions are going to be in the future, we can start to understand where we might have berry patches located later on. And if you were at his talk in the discussion and question time, we noticed some really awesome ways to connect this type of modeling data back to local decision making. So thinking about where are trails located in relation to this? How do we connect back to that? Or with Harmony's grandma, how am I going to find where to pick my berries next season? Um, we can use this kind of information at that level. And moving up, we also know that geospatial data is really useful for communities to help monitor and mitigate natural hazards. So this work comes from Reese's work, so got any questions about it specifically, we'll talk to him later on. Um, but we, anyone who lives in coastal Alaska knows that the shoreline is changing and it's changing really, really fast. Um, and we can use GPS measurements, we can use um, drone imagery, 
all sorts of different geospatial information to create maps like this that show exactly where and when we see some of these changes in space. And you'll notice that these, these are the different shoreline positions over time. And this is in Dillingham right near the sewage lagoon. So what we can do with this is as a community, you might have to submit this for if you're looking for funding to try to address this potential problem. Um, these are usually often maps are required in a lot of those funding applications. Um, and being able to create this or understand this is really important. And then as we continue to kind of move up, take a step back from the local level, we also have data like remote sensing information from satellites that can give us this kind of bigger picture context for what we're actually seeing locally on the ground. Um, so we can start to take a step back and look at, okay, changes in shoreline and erosion rates across the entire coastline or across the entire state. And a lot of this data is really important when you get up into the like science policy interface and we're looking at how these changes are driving decision making within the state. Um, and we can create really pretty time lapses too. And this is not, this anybody can create, you don't need any kind of technical skills and expertise. You just need to know where to look and how to be able to showcase this information to people. Um, so all of this is gonna, what we wanna say is that geospatial data is important from if you're trying to make a decision about where you're gonna be harvesting something, all the way up to driving how we're making climate change policy decisions at the state or federal national level. Um, and there's not a great way for people to learn about this. There's not awesome opportunities for people to understand what this means. And there's a lot of jargon in this space that make it kind of inaccessible for people. So to get the conversation going, um, what we want everybody to do now, you've had a day to kind of get to know each other, but even if you haven't, even better. Um, I know we've got all sorts of different levels of like, yes, I use maps every day. No, I've never even heard the word geospatial. I think that's pretty jargony, which it is. Um, and so wherever you're at, <laughs> um, take just a couple minutes, maybe like turn to like a couple people next to you um, and what um, think about a climate change or a local relevant land issue to you or your community. Not that your community, you get to define what your community is and how that looks to you. Um, and think about what geospatial tools, so what maps, what data or tools are you already using or what would you need in order to address that climate change issue? So just take a couple minutes, talk to each other. It's too quiet when you're not talking to me. <laughs> 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 if you're on Zoom, you can Yeah, so that's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Shout out an example or two of what an example that you discussed. It's like a geospatial uh, issue for your community. Anybody got one? I have one that you actually showed the slide of the Dillingham Sewage Lagoon. And that map actually was, it was made by a, a guy, Mike Lettering. That, that map actually went into a proposal and got $5 million for the, like, the feasibility planning of what to do with the sewage lagoon. lagoon. So it shows that it, it went for real money. Awesome. Does anybody else have another example? Air pollution? Yeah. And what and like what would you look at in terms of like looking at a map or like what kind of what would you need for it? Wind currents. Wind, <laughs> wind currents. Well, we were just saying, yeah, you could look at wind currents, you could have individual monitoring stations and see how wind kind of transports and helps or doesn't help air pollution in the winter in Fairbanks or during fire season. Yeah. I was thinking places in, I had the same thing, but like where CO2 would settle most in the valleys in Fairbanks would be a good map. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and that kind of ties into yesterday's wind farm stuff, stuff too, right? Like you might know, right? Like this point is the wind farm point, but if you're gonna do, if you need to get some funding for either an air pollution question or wind farm or something like that, then you need to be able to show it. Um, so awesome, thank you guys. So the next thing that we're gonna have you do with the last little chunk of our time, um, is we do have a survey. We'd love for you to fill it out. Um, there's a QR code right here. If you need to get online in this room, it's the Bristol, it's the one that's like ask yeah. for the password and the password is check 2022. If you don't have a phone or you don't want to be on your phone or your internet doesn't work, we have paper copies too. Um, who, raise your hand if you want a paper copy. Yeah, all right. And this is not a test. Like, yeah, <laughs> teacher, this is just ideas and brainstorming for us to learn from you guys about what some of the priorities are. Oh, yeah. Who else has a paper copy that didn't oh, yeah. have a and if you have any questions as you're going over it, like Noelle said, this is not a test, so keep chatting. Um, if something doesn't make sense to you, ask us. Yeah. It's also short. So. Um, so uh, we could 
the official 15 minute mark. Feel free to keep writing. Um, a couple of things. One is that, like you said, this is the early stage. So if this is something that you're like, sweet, we like have an idea for something that we need either training or we need geospatial products or we just want to chat and like see where we can collaborate, like definitely come talk to us. Um, like I said, we're an idea generation phase, so come talk to us. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, we're going to be around um, the rest of the time here. We're on the we're on tomorrow's flight. So if you don't finish it or if you want more and you want to hand to somebody that was at the other session, we've got more copies. Please do and just get them to us before uh, we get off the plane and we're going back that way. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Is that time lapse? How do you get that time lapse? Is it actual time lapse and the policy of the pictures or video taken? Uh, yeah, good question. I'm gonna pass it to you. So that one in particular is from the Landsat Landsat satellite imagery. So it's a US, it's a government satellite, but it's freely available public data. And so the frequency of the actual images varies quite a bit, usually every like 15 to 30 days. Um, but so what we did with that is basically it takes all of the images from the summer and basically meshes them together into a composite. And so then that's just showing every year what it looks like um, from a combination of different photos. But it's all freely available and you can go online. I can show you the link where you just hit a couple things, draw an area that you're interested in, and you can also see um, whatever region you want that's changing since the Landsat record, which is back to 1982 up till the present. Another quick question. Uh, we're aware of coastal erosion. Do you know of any areas in Alaska that's attrition? There are a few areas where you're getting minor attrition. Chris may be able to speak at least a little better to that than I do. Um, do you guys have any examples? Yeah, I mean, some places like you know, one example is at Pilot Point near here, where you know there's a lot, a lot of erosion going on, but uh, there's also areas of accretion. And one historical example is their cannery there actually had to close down in the I believe it was in the 50s because there was so much accretion because the dock was built up that they could no longer get the ships in there and so they uh, shut this historic cannery down not because of erosion but because of accretion 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 yeah accretion, that's the accretion. opposite of erosion yeah attrition makes sounds sounds similar <laughs> one more question So like Lanza has all their data, you know, the Forest Service has their data layers, the Bureau of Cens uh, Census Bureau has all their geospatial stuff online. Is there like a dictionary or an index of all the places that you get free public GIS data? No, no, and that's probably <laughs> one of the biggest barriers to, to yeah. using it yeah. and accessing it, right? Like is it any of you guys have like needed a data set that's not an easy repository? Yeah. Um, so you have to have like a little bit of an idea of what you're looking for and some basic knowledge of like who hosts different data sets, mm -hmm. um, which is like, I think one of those data gaps that we're hoping to like identify, like what are the things, okay, that like, yeah. do you spend all your time Googling and trying to figure out where to go? Or can you so many, <laughs> so, <laughs> so many Yeah, no, and that's a, that's a big problem and we're just getting more data. Right, like yeah. there's always new satellites in the sky catch, capturing more data, higher resolution data, and like how do we make sure that people can get it? Yeah, it's a really big topic right now, and there's not a good answer. Like, yeah, so there's, there's, library. yeah, so much, yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are definitely some places that have like yeah. some data, like Google Earth Engine, for example, hosts a lot of this publicly available data. Um, there's a bunch of different repositories, but there's not one that's yeah. like this is the one above all else. It's kind of like definitely pocketed in silo, which is frustrating. All right, thank you. Thank you. We get our grades. You all get A's. Yeah, if you're done, I guess we should focus. Or we'll get a match. Yeah. Well, well, it's great to do a survey. I'm also leading into a survey, so you know, we've got you guys warmed up. Um, but I just want to say um, that it's really nice to be a guest on Tori Young Tribal Lands. Um, I'm originally from Nakhmik, and my English name is Tuga. Uh, my English name is Harmony Jade. Um, and so, yeah, happy to be back home ish um, and here with everyone. Um, but now I work for um, Alaska Sea Grant as a fellow um, under the NOAA Marine Debris Program. 
uh, based out of Anchorage now on Islands. So I'll just go a little bit of an overview of marine debris in Alaska, what makes it unique. As you guys probably already know, um, I'm not an expert in this field at all, so I'm really excited to hear more um, of your experience with the topic. Um, and then the action planning effort that is going on right now um, with NOAA. Here we go. So, yeah, what is marine debris? Um, it's anything from like a single styrofoam pellet that's on the beach to uh, abandoned derelict vessels, um, which sometimes we have a lot of here. And, and like, so yeah, any of this is super expensive um, and it's hard to remove, especially in Alaska. Derelict vessels run around like yeah, $10 million or something. Um, but there's a lot of great people um, trying to do the work of, of cleaning this up um, and then what we can also do to, to prevent it. And impacts, um, it's probably a little bit of review, but obvious entanglement um, issues with um, marine mammals, ghost fishing with uh, left crab pots um, and gear and entanglement of um, infrastructure like loose lines and props. But marine debris in Alaska. So NOAA is more of the grant agency um, and marine debris as a topic. So we fund um, our partners to do um, the actual work of the cleanups. Um, and here in, in this map, you can see uh, projects that we funded all throughout um, Alaska. And a lot of them are centered um, in the Gulf and in the bearing um, on what's called like catcher beaches um, based on the currents and um, a lot that has to do with log jams. And so uh, it was great to hear more about, about this geospace role gap needs because we definitely have gaps in assessing how much debris is actually in Alaska because um, again, they're in these log jams and you can't see it from above, but once you get close, it looks something more like this. Um, but yeah, in this action planning effort, we're trying to capture um, this unique context of uh, marine debris in Alaska, that it's a lot of large items, fishing gear, the access is super challenging. We always need more money to do it. Um, remoteness and um, seasonality. So we can only go out uh, in the summer and often it's by a charter vessel and then where we put the debris after we've cleaned it up and it's often a burden on, on small communities. So I'm trying to uh, merge that gap between the federal agency and communities now with my position and just trying to get more of that community voice um, into this planning effort to hopefully get more funding in the future. Um, so the goal of the action plan, um, it's going to be in these different categories um, of actions, needs, priorities, and context. Um, so actions, we have a lot of great partners that are already very involved in the topic, what's already being done, capturing that um, it's yeah there's obviously a lot more that needs to be done so the gaps um, and challenges that exist and then what does the community want to prioritize and context um, we want to paint a picture for maybe our dc um, counterparts that uh, this isn't just going to a beach and cleaning up plastic bottles and straws this is a huge problem that requires a lot of logistical um, coordination and often in very remote sites, uh, which is shocking for people that aren't used to the problem um, and for Alaska in general. Um, so the current status of the Marine Reaction Plan, I gave the same presentation a couple times already if you were at uh, Alaska Forum on the Environment, um, Alaska Marine Science Symposium, ADCAM, Alaska Tribal Conference, I can't remember all these acronyms. Um, and then this is my last listening session, um, but we also have a survey. So if you wanna be in, like have more of a voice in that um, and then webinars coming up. Um, so just contact me and I can put you on the email list. Um, and this is a living document. So it's not only um, just this round, uh, but this is about 10 years in the making. So we're just trying to get a draft out there um, and have as much stakeholder engagement as possible while also pushing forward um, to get more funding. 
yeah, this is just a summary of um, what we've been doing so far for the action plan. So a lot of it is listening sessions, um, direct comments from people, um, and then the webinars all to the survey. The survey goes out um, and then we'll uh, get a final draft here. And again, just a little bit of a timeline. Um, we also have a steering committee that goes through all of our um, our feedback and drafts, um, and there are people that are very engaged in the topic throughout Alaska and in different sectors, like St. Paul is a partner of ours. Uh, and so we'll hopefully get a draft this spring. That's what I'll be working on after this, is just writing up everyone's comments um, and then feedback uh, portion to our mailing list. So if you wanna also be included on the mailing list, just let me know. Um, refinement over the subsistence season, um, but again, trying to offer another portion for feedback um, in the fall, but I know that people are really busy with the food season. So um, this is ongoing process and we'll have revising uh, periods um, coming up. So don't feel like if you don't get a, a stake in it now that it's done forever, it'll continue to be revised. So yeah, if you guys wanna <laughs> link into the survey form, <laughs> I didn't have the printed uh, copies, but ours is a little bit longer. <laughs> um, just warning. Uh, so feel free to just save it as a tab uh, and get back to it later and when you have some more time to think about it. But it's a complex issue and I'm excited to hear more yeah. um, your thoughts on it. But yeah, that's all I have. Any questions? What, what are some of like the big implications of terrain debris? Like, you know, what's the what's the problem with it? Why not just leave it there? A lot of it's ingestion and just like getting into the food web. Um, yeah, I think the reason one of the reasons why I took this job is uh, someone from back home told me it's like, oh, we're so worried about the management decisions of our fishery, but we should really be worrying about like all these plastics on our beaches. And yeah, I didn't really think about it until then, but then I looked at the sand on the Mecca beach and I was like, I see a lot of microplastics in here. Oh and I've just seen that like over my lifetime, which isn't that long. So um, yeah, it's concerning for sure. What kind of streams um, are currently being uh, used to send the debris that's collected? Um, where, where does it go and what's done with it? Yeah, that's a great question. I feel like, um, yeah, capturing the disposal challenge is what I'm trying to do in the action plan too, is that um, a lot of times it's, um, yeah, put on a barge and then sent down south to like a landfill or a recycling plant. Um, recycling takes a lot of sorting. And so you have to have um, someone that's knowledgeable um, about the different types of plastics, but Ocean Plastics Recovery Network, they're one of our partners out of Kodiak and um, one of the co-founders is a chemical engineer that is um, like, yeah, works for in Silicon Valley on recycling of complex waste streams. So we're trying to have a better solution, but right now it's basically like we're removing it from sensitive habitats and then we're just sending it to down south which is like inland, but the amount of like carbon footprint that that requires is kind of insane. And I know a lot of the marine debris that washes up, it's, you know, most of it is not from the places where it washes up, right? And so do you see a lot of variation between communities on the coast as to like, you know, there are places where there's huge volumes and other places where it's still an issue, but less so? Yeah, I think that there's definitely hotspots yeah. based on the currents and like St. Paul is a hotspot. Um, just based on location of in the Bering Sea. Um, I think it depends on, yeah, where the cleanup is to see like the composition of the debris, but a lot of it is fishing gear. Um, and then in the Gulf, there's a lot of container spills. And right now there's not uh, as much consumer response, or not consumer, but the producer responsibility as far as that container spill. Like some of our partners, like Global Alaska Keeper, they're like, we found rubber ducks for 
for years, or we found fly swatters, or like these bike helmets for kids that have like little mohawks on them. <laughs> and so it's kind of crazy at how much how many things you can find out there. But maybe we won't have you know the container spills in the bearing um, more of the fishing gear. Maybe you take a little break. That's all I have for you guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I'm always aware when there's a boat like blazing out in the bay, and you can see it, and it's on the radio, but then they just let it burn and sink. Is that something that people go and get in the trees and clean, maybe? Or is it just sitting down in the bottom of the fish? Oh, like if a boat goes down yeah. right here? Um, I feel like that's Coast Guard jurisdiction as far as like when something's actually going down because I know that they have to have mitigation for the fuel on board um, and containing all of that. But a lot of the, well, maybe this is, I don't know if this should be on the record or not with my Noah, but um, my brother was a salvage driver in Alaska and a lot of those guys for or like salvage shop, they ended up sinking the boat at the end, like taking off all the fuel, all the contaminants, and then putting some six foot dynamite on it and sinking it down because it's too expensive to do anything else with it. But yeah, tricky. I don't think that they're doing that for the day boat, so. think about those questions. Uh, so um, this is through NOAA and, and um, I'm wondering about, since you mentioned stakeholders, is there any partnerships right now with different nonprofits or NGOs as far as looking at small business development to kind of creatively come up to solutions for the debris? I don't know about small businesses, but we have a lot of nonprofit um, partners, yeah, like um, Ocean Plastics Recovery and Ocean Conservancy is one of our main partners. Oh, I should reframe that question. So um, just thinking about different small or NGOs and nonprofits in, within the state that are looking at how to fund small business development. Like to reuse free debris? Yeah. Um, I don't think NOAA is directly catalyzing that because our grants are quite extensive to apply to, but we're trying to capture that, you know, $10,000, $5,000 would be more useful in this space for Alaska. Um, there's definitely some local businesses that are starting, like Pat Simpson out of Cordova. He does like turning marine debris into artificial logs for house building. So there's, there's people that are, yeah, engaged in trying to make a business off of it, but right now they're still relying on grants and it's not profitable until you can scale it up. And that's, I guess, what I've heard from our partners. Did uh, Senator Sullivan's Save Our Seas legislation contribute to this? Yeah, it definitely put more initiative to actually getting the action plan moving forward because um, Alaska and Rhode Island, I think, are the only states that don't have plans. Um, and uh, the plan, it just helps, yeah, coalesce the issue into something that's a little bit more easily digestible for people. And so Sullivan's very engaged and um, this, uh, what is it, Marine Stewardship Foundation, or the, the foundation that was formed off of the Save Our Seas. Um, we have Alaskan, a lot of Alaskan partners in. So I'm excited to see that there's so much congressional engagement on the topic and hopefully more funding. So we've gotten a lot more funding for it this, this past year. That's so, good. Yeah. And it's just claim to fame. Yeah, it's exactly. Like any stuff. <laughs> 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 yeah.